the more you know, blank faces. Um, you know, I, I realized that, uh, you know, the way the world is working, I mean, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, some, some associations uh, of psychotherapists are looking to, uh, uh, you know, prescribe medication. Uh, I think uh, last, a few, um, about a month ago, uh, the psychology, the psychologists came up with their modalities, and I think it was 0.5% will actually admit by their own admission to doing any kind of conjoint therapy. Uh, and then uh, the AMFT did a, a survey a few years ago uh, and uh, of how many therapists that belong to AMFT do systemic work. And I was somewhat taken back when I think it was like 13% that actually are really uh, you know, working in a more of a systemic level. And I remember it was right before uh, Sal Salvador Meduchin died and he said, oh my God, what happened? What's happening to the family and family therapy? or systemic therapy. So uh, given what's going on out there and given what we all know, I mean, it's not surprising, anyone who's systemic, it's, it can't be surprising what's going on uh, because we have a tendency to look at things in a, in a, a more holistic way. So without further ado, uh, my favorite quote uh, is, by Gregory Bateson, uh, who uh, I spent many, many hours with years ago. Um, the major problems of the world are the result of the difference between how nature works and the way people think it works. And I think it's so, so, so much more prevalent and, and important now. Um, I, I've also uh, been associated with, with Nora Bates and who's kind of rejuvenated my, my feelings about systems thinking. Uh, uh, she was you know, very young when, when her father passed away, which uh, about five years ago, she did a film on Gregory Bateson. It's called The uh, uh, Steps to an Ecology of Mind. It's a wonderful film where she interviews a lot of people. And she's kind of picked up the baton and picked up where he left off. Uh, she's a very poetic and uh, uh, wonderful thinker, one of the most rigorous thinkers that I could think of that deals with systems. And you know, she just recently said, I actually got this yesterday from her, we need the existing, I can't even see my, uh, my screen there. Uh, we need the existing systemic, let's see. Actually, uh, let's see. Uh, Allison, could you read that, that top one? For some reason, I'm getting a kind of a blank on that top one. Sure, it says we need the existing system to be healthy enough to provide the assets to build the bridge to the next system but at the same time to be frail enough that it gives up wanting to survive. So basically, thank you. Um, you know, I think what's happening there is that, yeah, you know, we, people are talking about going back to normal and we just can't start chaotically, obviously. Uh, we may need to use part of the existing system, uh, but it hasn't been working. And I think in many ways we have to look at it and we have to be able to move to the next level. And that's what I think systems thinking, systems change is about. So who today, and going forward can now doubt the need to take care of ourselves and of each other. I mean, this is really something we have to start doing. A prerequisite for systems thinking is to be mindful. I mean, everybody's talking about mindfulness. When I, when I was at, doing my dissertation uh, at Columbia, um, you know, many years ago, uh, I was interested in doing some mindfulness. I, I was working, doing, working on, actually with Gregory Bateson and Paul Byers and to do uh, studies of double bind, how people get double binded. You know, and that was such a big important thing for you know, family therapy. And I remember going down to the basement of the library where they had a gigantic computer. And I'm really not that old, but I'll tell you, it was a big, big computer. And I, I asked for uh, you know, a search on mindfulness and I got something like 10 articles you know, 10 articles from somewhere related to, you know, Buddhism and whatnot. Well, if you go on, on Google right now and you, and you put, put in mindfulness, you're going to get 10 million, you know. So, but mindfulness, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk who actually popularized mindfulness, says when you're mindful, you, can, you are fully alive, you are fully present, and you can get in touch with the wonders of life that can nourish and heal you. And that is, to me, before we even could talk about systems thinking, we have to also understand our body is systemic and how we all are interrelated and we're part 
and parcels simultaneous to a lot of things. So what I've been doing also in the last many uh, several years is doing a lot of breathing and meditating in sessions. And I found that, you know, sometimes taking five to seven or eight minutes, you get a hell of a lot more in a session and also for yourself too. So we all know this, but I just want to mention it quickly. You know, we could do a whole, you know, day on this, but that there's, a, we have to understand what the biology of stress is about. And I, I talk to this, I talk about this a lot. Uh, you know, we have a nervous system and it's autonomic. All right. Uh, we have two parts, a calm part, you know, uh, and we have the fight or flight, you know, but the nervous system, when you're in fight or flight, it, it, it's, it's, it basically, the, uh, it contracts our, our, our frontal lobal area of our brain, all the blood goes to the arms and legs so we can run like hell. And that's how we're made, you know, naturally. Um, if you get you know more you know, more into it specifically, our nervous system monitors signals, uh, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal glands. You know they work together. So when you're in fight or flight, excess hormones compromise, and this is the big thing: the vagus nerve. You know I usually would ask how many people know about the vagus nerve, and, and I'm not talking about Las Vegas. I mean the vagus nerve. Vagus means Latin and. Uh, it is Latin, the Vegas is Latin, meaning um, uh, wandering. And it's an amazing nerve because it, co it connects our, our stomach, our gut, our brain, our heart, uh, our metabolism, and it's the nerve of compassion. Uh, a friend of mine out in, uh, in Berkeley, Dasher Keltner, you might have heard of, he, he runs the, uh, uh, there's an institute, Institute for Oh God, for joy or something like that. It's a wonderful, positive institute. He wrote a book on Born to be Good a few years ago. And he talks about the vagus nerve as being so important. It's a nerve of, comp uh, of uh, compassion. And uh, if you're familiar with the polyvagal theory, uh, Stephen Borges, I think I pronounced his last name, uh, there's a lot of movement now and in, in research that says that when this vagus nerve, which is a nerve of compassion, is compromised, it creates insecurity. And I feel most of the researchers feel that that's really the, the core of, of, of uh, autism and people on the spectrum. And also just us humans not really, you know, working on all, all eight cylinders. So it's automatic. It's 95% automatic. And one of the only ways to get around it is there's a few strange ways. I mean, one is gargling. Somehow you break the, you go from the, you know, from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. But the most popular one and the most effective one is breathing. And I use, I use what is called coherent breathing. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of that. But coherent breathing has been researched. Uh, Dr. Richard Brown and his wife, uh, Patricia Gerbig, uh, have done a lot of research. Uh, I, I recently took a workshop, it was at the Ackerman, just on breathing. And I kind of you know, connected with him. He does Aikido, and I, I've been doing Aikido for 35 years. Uh, and in that martial art, we do a lot of breathing. But what coherent breathing is about, and what he did, and uh, uh, he wrote a, they wrote a book just recently, um, is that they did a control group. They've had people who were depressed, people who had different ailments, and they would do uh, 150 people taking medication for that particular uh, symptom or pattern, and people doing the coherent breathing, which is six seconds in and six seconds out with an exhale. And, but the exhale has to activate the vagus nerve. So what you do is you think of something positive. And in their, in their research, which is quite extensive, and, I obviously have more funding than I could possibly have to do that, is that the people who did the coherent breathing uh, scored, if not better, not worse, if not the same, but if not better. So I'm going to ask you all to do that for just for five minutes. Basically, what, what, the, what it's about is that normally we breathe out like 15 breaths per second. Uh, coherent breathing, and there's other forms of this in yoga and whatnot, is that you're breathing at 15, at, at five breaths per, se, uh, per minute. I mean, let me say that again. 15 breaths per minute is normal, average. The coherent breathing is five breaths per, per minute. And they say if you do it for a minimum of five minutes, it not only activates your vagus nerve and takes you out of the fight or flight, which is a lot of people do who meditate know that. And we all kind of, I think we all know that, uh, uh, you know, as far as uh, just knowing it through common sense, but it also helps your heart rate variable. 
And, it's, and, in, and in turn, when your heart rate variable is working better, which is the beat of your heart rate, which is not always consistent, it, 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 it beats in different uh, forms. And we know with the, with now with technology that if your heart rate variable increases to a certain degree like through working out and whatnot, you actually enhance your immune system. So what I'm asking you to do just for uh, a few minutes, we don't have to go to a whole five minutes, is I want you to just to relax. Um, you could just close your eyes or you could keep your eyes open. But I would like you just to think of a kind of a, a quick progressive relaxation. You know, feel the muscles in your head loosen up. If you're sitting on a chair, let your hands be like weights and pull your arms down. Just feel yourself sinking into your chair. Just allow yourself to feel a sense of difference. Imagine you're your, your cheeks becoming relaxed and your tongue kind of falling with gravity as your jaw relaxes. And then just feel the rest of your body fall into place. Feel a kind of a collective energy. And that's part of also systemic communication is when we join, you know, when we feel each other's rhythms. And I'm gonna play, uh, I have a little thing here. And I give, by the way, if you ever, I could send anybody any information that I'm talking about. So feel free to contact me, but I'm gonna play a, be, uh, a chime, uh, a louder chime where you breathe in and the softer chime breathing out with a positive thought. And so just so instead of you counting, you know, six seconds in, six, six, six seconds out, the bells will help you regulate. So here we go. Okay, and the next loud bell, we're gonna breathe in. So breathe in. Okay, I'm sorry, breathing in now. Okay, then breathe out. Okay, so the next loud, loud bell, breathe in. So breathe in. with a positive thought. Breathe in softly, filling up your stomach, bring it up to your chest, and out. Again, with a positive thought, could be anything, anything that's positive. system and breathe out with a positive thought. It could be anything. The farmer who grew your grains, a pretty flower. And then just feel the air coming out, deflating your stomach last. Breathing in. for about a minute on our own. Just kind of wiggle a little bit and kind of open your eyes slowly. Uh, we only did a few mm. minutes, but I think you get the idea that, you know, we, we consist of a lot of energy and, and a lot of rhythms. And sometimes we need to just stop. Uh, and when we're out of the fight or flight, which we shouldn't be using, you know, 24 hours a day to save our life. It's autonomic. And so when we get stuck, we stay there. And that creates a lot of havoc. It creates health havocs. It creates, 
it makes you dumber in many ways. You know, our gut needs to be, have our cells replaced, you know, every uh, like 72 hours or so. Uh, when you're in fight or flight, it doesn't happen very often. And uh, when we're fearful, as uh, FDR said, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So way back when, when I did my dissertation, I, 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 I tried to define a system and, uh, and a system is a collection of items, entities, persons, institutions, societies, atoms, etc. So arranged that a change in the relationship of one part will produce some changes in all the relationships of other parts of that system. Spelled wrong there. Um, how is the, how is this, how, if, I'm going to pose some questions that we could revisit a little later and hopefully we will, but how is the whole more than the sum of the parts? I want you to think about these inquiries. You know, as systemic thinkers, what did we already know? And what are we learning about in this surreal pandemic time? What I've done over the years is, is to come up with a, a, a ever evolving, you know, um, a, a framework that when I work with people and not only working in, in therapy, but just working in life together and uh, myself. Um, you know, I feel that it's really important that we look for differences. And I think when you're looking at, when you're dealing with systemic thoughts or a framework, you know, you're looking for differences. You're not looking for anything static. A difference that makes a difference is what, you know, Gregory Bateson always would say. So the way I look at it is that when we define our perspective, you know, we're dealing with paradoxes. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Because that's what life's about. That's what nature's about. Nature's messy. There's a lot of contradictions, but somehow the whole comes together, or as the Greeks call it, Gaia. You know, the earth is more than the sum of its parts. Our body is more than the sum of its parts. And yet, if we work with the vagus nerve, we work with different parts, we're enhancing the whole, the whole of our existence. How do we function in the present? You know, one of my other favorite words besides, you know, context, which is what I'll talk about in a minute, is liminal, which in anthropology, my background, you know, basically was anthropology and psychology. Liminal is that, is being in the present and being available and ready for changes, you know, changes that make a difference. And also, we also need an environment that's supportive, because if we don't deal with our paradoxes, we end up with those double binds, which... Good, a good family therapist knows that when you, someone comes in, especially in a relationship issue, uh, and there's triangles and all kinds of things that, that kind of distort you know, people's communication, we get into double binds, and they're unenviable situations. You know, damn if you do and damn if you dare. The way to get out of that, though, is to create possibilities, and that's why we look at context over content. That is sort of one of our mantras as system sinkers. So how are we able to make adjustments? And that's the final part. If we're in life and we're constantly making adjustments, and I, I call that transcontextual, because every context is connected to another context. And that is part of what it is that we do and what we need to sometimes revisit and reconstitute. So since we are part of nature, as I mentioned before, we constantly encounter those ever-present contradictory instances or paradoxes. So the questions I pose here that we could talk about, and again, for you to contemplate on is how do these challenges, how do the challenges of those ever-present paradoxes benefit us in our sense of self? You know, how do we mitigate conflict? You know, what are the paramount paradoxes we need to address during this trying time? There's a lot of paradoxes, you know, I was just uh, you know, reading an article about someone saying, well, I have to go to the dentist, you know, but I don't want to go to the dentist. And, uh, and then the uh, article was like, well, you know, possibly if they had testing and the dentist was tested, and then that they would, you would feel good about the dentist, but then the dentist has to also know if you were tested and how do we work these things out? How do we go back to a pattern that not necessarily is the, the norm, whatever that may be, how do we, you know, how do we benefit from paradoxes? Uh, Carl Jung said that the goal of life is to work through paradoxes, and that's how you find yourself. So, but not a whole lot of, you know, psychotherapy schools really deal with that. And I think when you're systemic, 
it's sometimes more difficult on one level, but it's a hell of a lot more rewarding because we're really dealing how nature works. So what stops us from, from engaging in resolving paradoxes? Well, we have cultural and language constraints uh, that make us vulnerable to miss the many interconnected parts, you know, and not initially see how they affect this larger whole of nature. You know, nature works in many ways and we're learning new things all the time. I also read a lot more time to read, you know, when we're kind of sequestered, but um, that how, how ch trees work together. You know, I don't know if you read about forest bathing, you know, which is big in Korea and Japan. Uh, you know, when trees work together, when one tree is, is being compromised by <coughs> sex or disease or, or by humans, the other trees send messages through the root system to try to enhance, to try to defend. These are things that are amazing. And they are things that kind of do resolve these, these unexplained things that are explainable when we really take a, a more stereoscopic look. So what are the consequences of unresolved paradoxes? Well, we know a lot. Parad when we're in double binds, and most of our problems are when we're stuck in those, those double binds that, that, have, that are paradoxes that are not, have not been dealt with. And what do we most need to lessen injurious societal, societal and environmental problems? You know, how do we become mitigators? How do we lessen the amount of the ever present, you know, uh, interaction, conflicts? So if we use a wider perspective and better understand how systems work, then like quantum physics, there can be many points of view and it could all be correct. You know, the Eskimos have a hundred different words for, for snow. You know, uh, we get stuck into DSM and ICD and labels and things like that. Uh, look at how this whole thing is evolving in the, in the hospitals. Uh, those incredible, brave people working and how are they dealing and coping with knowledge? They're sharing, they're texting, they're sharing with each other, the different views. And they're looking now you know, which might, would have been nice if some of these things were discussed before, but we created a lot of fragmentation. So how can we use a wider lens or a perspective? How do we sustain our values? You know, when I said you have many different views, well, you can have some really views that are injurious. So how do we always look at our values? How do we mitigate the amount of violence? You know, uh, you know Buddhism is a very beautiful, uh, uh, you know, religion, but they talk about, you know, suffering, and yes, there is. Nature is full of suffering. But it's also very beautiful if you look at some of the, the impacts of, of, of how nature comes together. And even some of the wonderful sutras that are in Buddhism or in mystical Christianity or Judaism. So in what ways do we see our future roles, my friends, my colleagues, regarding cultural, social, political, environmental, mental health? You know, do we still teach in education in fragments and 45 minute periods? You know, do we still separate ourselves uh, economically in disparities? We can't conquer the world, but do we have in essence a, a mission to start at each moment? Because each moment is connected to other moments. So obviously, I mean, if we were doing more interactive, we could play out some of these things. And I hope we could really talk about it mostly in a, in our uh, last half at least. So liminal is that transition. It's an initial stage. I know that words are not the, the thing, you know, we talked about that, but it's, uh, uh, we probably should have more verbs. We should deal with more verbs, not nouns. But uh, limin, liminal is, um, I used to use the word liminality because it's more of an adjective, but it's a transitional stage. It's a, of a complex, complex interactive process between what was happening and what will happen. You know, it's that aesthetic moment, you know, when you decide to write a poem or when you have that feeling that is beyond language. And we have so many different possibilities. When we do that, we don't get stuck into dictating. It is that moment not necessarily being predictable, God forbid, but where profound improvisational connecting patterns and change can take place when we are patient and open to new journeys. It's not easy to... Uh, you know, talk about, I mean, I, I was asked to do a, a similar talk at the, uh, uh, at the New York Medical College, uh, which, you know, I also practice homeopathy. And at one time it was uh, the New York Homeopathic College for many, many, many years, more years than what it is now. 
And I was dealing with uh, uh, young doctors that are just finishing their uh, last courses and we're going into residency. And I believe a lot of these young people, I felt like I was with a lot of 12 year olds, but they were, <laughs> they were like in their late twenties. Uh, and a lot of them ended up going into the hospitals uh, almost prematurely. But their orientation was so linear in so many ways. I mean, this was an elective that they took. And they were so excited to hear about systemic ways of looking at things. You know, because they were told, you know, do you choose uh, orthopedic uh, surgery or pediatrics and this and that. And it was hard for them to connect. And they were really, you know, being really frustrated and being dictated by the pharmaceutical companies. So the questions I pose, like, what are the barriers to being in the present? You know, how do, you dre- how do we address the map is not the territory and the name is not the thing? You know, not too abstract when you really think about it. If we get stuck and we just fall into place culturally. How does context come into play when experiences, when we experience those liminal moments, those moments that sometimes may not seem logical? And these are things I want you to think about. I mean, we could talk about, because I'm hoping that we could come up with a, a beginning of a collaborative way of looking at, at, at systems thinking. And in many ways for people who are out there who are family therapists, you know, we're really, uh, uh, our voice is, 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 has been more suppressed. You know, most of the programs, I think Seton Hall no longer has a program. Uh, uh, College of New Jersey no longer has a program. Uh, I think there's only 600. Well, Jim, you probably know better than I. I'm not that many licensed uh, family therapists, uh, mm-hmm. but there's many more you know, social workers, many more uh, psychologists and psychiatrists. And, uh, uh, and somehow, you know, uh, the, the voice of being systemic seems to be being pushed, you know, to the, to the wayside. And yet in moments like this, it's obvious what we might need. So each transition is an improvisational mo- moment. I love going to improv uh, theaters. And my daughter, Brielle, who did the workshop with me at, uh, at Ackerman, we did a lot of improv to make these points. And it was great, not only verbally, but also physically, where people had to like move and, and hold each other in different ways. So each transition is, is an improvisational moment all the time with implications of how we learn, how we educate, and so on. So no one formula that fits all. As William Blake said, in a grain of sand, the landscape appears. So the questions I was thinking about when I was putting this together is how do we as individuals and therapists navigate needed change given the state of our world? How do we influence, learn, and evolve? You know, I, I, we evolve in context. We don't evolve in content. And I think that's a big uh, mistake to go that route. I'm not sure how many people are f- familiar with Re- Re- Rebecca Solnit, a wonderful author. And I, this quote seemed to fit right here. You know, leave the door open for the unknown. The door into the dark. That's where the most important things come from. Where you will yourself come from and where you will go. So those little moments sometimes could be frightening. We are vulnerable, but when you're vulnerable, you're more human. And I think that's some of the things that we need to do as therapists, especially when we join and we dialogue and we collaborate, you know, with who we work with, not only in our clinical settings, but also in our, in our life. If anybody has a question or anything, you know, do either raise your hand and, uh, you know, unmute yourself. Unmute, that sounds so strange, isn't it? A liminal process cannot be found in individuals. This is something also that Nora Bateson uh, recently uh, I, had, I had a wonderful experience. I went to uh, Poland. Uh, I was at one of 50 people asked to go to, uh, uh, she's now president of the International Bateson Associ- Association or International Bateson uh, Group. And uh, there was people from all over the world. And our role was to ha- figure out how could we create a more systemic form of communication that crosses disciplines. And one of the things that, you know, we, we talked about is that this process cannot be found in individuals, rather it's found between them. It cannot be found in organizations or nations or religions or institutions. It is found between them. And that's the process, the process. How does mutual learning become a vital part 
of systems thinking and change? How do we make sense of relational information that we observe and participate in complex situations? Let me, let me just do a, I, I have a, a, an example of a, a short case vignette. It'll just take me a, a minute. Uh, and this is true. And it's sort of how I'm starting to work. I'm, I'm starting to really get back to my, my systemic roots. You know, it, uh, it, recently I had two parents and there are three adult children coming to my office. I need not get into the backgrounds of, uh, and the genogram, which, which provided me with the necessary information and uh, culture, race, class, gender, diversity, and things like that, developmental issues. Except I want to mention that their presenting problem was of communication discord. What concerned me most was how they had been continually repeating roles, patterns, and issues that produced painful grievances and concerns. There was blame and narrow views of the cause of this cause and that cause and back and forth. And it's been going on for years. So, okay. Being that my ethnicity is Italian, you know, and I had just bought a nice hot loaf of Italian bread in one of those bakeries on Bloomfield Avenue. My, my point, uh, part, uh, officers in Montclair haven't been there in a while. Uh, I don't know what possessed me, but right at that moment, you know, I took that, that loaf of bread out, out of my knapsack and I threw it on the floor. And after a short time, I just looked, they looked at me and I said, I want each one of you to provide at least a minimum of five different contexts about what you could do with that bread. I mean, I just, it was impro improvisational. I mean, I could have thrown a banana, I guess, or something. I got over, in a short time, over a hundred scenarios of many which I could not have even imagined doing with my beloved bread. I mean, I was going to bring that bread home and dip it in some gravy. And <laughs> the tension subsided and there was laughter, uh, but most importantly, mutual learning from others and each other in such a numerous way. All I kept on hearing was, I never knew that about you. I never knew that. My subsequent sessions consisted of new dialogue, uh, it wasn't like I was a miracle worker, but I, did, I, was, I, I didn't want to sit there and listen to them yell and scream and be violent to each other because they were good people. And they had, you know, the problems that people bring in. The pain is of not having allowed these complex pieces of unpredictable information to be shared was brought into the therapy. So like a work of art, it created new meaning for the future. So I've been using bananas and, you know, things from my desk and whatnot. Uh, I, you know, we need to be able to step out of the box. You know, I, when I used to do my workshops, I used to use what, what I, I learned from uh, uh, Allison, you probably remember this years ago, uh, the, the nine dots uh, experiment that Mr. Wizard, you know, I learned that years ago uh, when, you, when you put a thing on your screen and you would copy down different things like the, it came on right after Winky Dink. I remember that when I was a kid. And of these nine dots, you know, Mr. Wizard said, I want you to connect these nine dots with four continuous lines without leaving the, uh, the paper or without leaving the screen. And it's almost impossible. People, and I still do this today. I worked with 100 doctors in Morristown Hospital. I, I did this. I said, if 5% get it, I'm going to, I'm not, I wouldn't use it anymore. Well, nobody got it until one person who was my age said, you step out of the box. So when you draw one line, way out, and then you come back and just do the other three. 95 doctors that couldn't do it. You know, I don't use it any, as much now because it's sort of like collectively, systemically, everybody knows that now. So you have to find something else. Um, you know, Nora Bateson coined a word when we were in, in, in Poland called somatosy, which is mutual learning. And it's a mix of different, you know, etiology words and the, uh, not etiology, what's the etiology is for disease, Etym etymology for, for words. Um, it opens the door to exploring our intention. It relates to parts of wider encompassing context or a transcontextual trans description. This abstract, not really. When you're mutually learning, when you're dealing with things, well, some different contexts come into play. Uh, she calls it warm data. And if you're ever interested in taking one of these warm data workshops, it's basically where small groups get into a, a conversation, mutually sharing a certain context as described. And then they get up and go to other tables where there's other contexts and they bring in 
their previous context and talk about and see how it could relate to other contexts. And before you know it, you're, you're seeing things in a much wider perspective. And that's how you break double binds. Uh, if you're interested, uh, Nora's book, uh, Small Arcs of Larger Circles, a very popular book, is well written, or you go to, uh, to, her, uh, to the website of the, of the International Basin uh, uh, Institute, that's what it's called, and uh, you can see some of these uh, articles on that. So how important are our relationships? What does it mean that it takes two to know one? You know, does it take two to know one? Does it take many to know many? You know, I mean, individual therapy, we all know that. I mean, we, we get, we, we start working with someone and we're still working systemically and we take their genogram, stuff like that. And we say, well, why don't you bring in your parent? And all of a sudden, the whole perspective changes and it gives you different segues to be able to make things better, you know, to make things different. Uh, so complexity, you know, and, and actually another word for systems thinking is complexity. And if you go on Twitter and uh, there's complexity groups and all kinds of things. And, but it's, it's giving us a segue to go into how can we look at government? How can we look at uh, 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 you know, inter interdependence? I like that word better than just collaboration. I like it better than partnership. You know, I, I often tell a story that, and you've probably heard this already, that, you know, a partner, partners, you can be partners, but does it really work? You know, like take, for example, the pig and the chicken. You know, they want to make a ham and egg sandwich, right? Uh, the chicken says, I, you know, I have no problem. You know, but the pig says, you know, I don't know about it. <laughs> and so they start dialoguing and collaborating. And what happens when they collaborate, if you go into Whole Foods, uh, if you're a Prime member, you get 10% off of the Happy Piggy Tofu Ham and Egg Sandwich. <laughs> Without ham. And even the chicken now is getting lazy. They have artificial eggs too. So uh, Cheryl Deal, who actually works for an organization about, it says, I can't remember, something like exploring fish. It deals a lot with marine biology. And she, I think it's the best definition of complexity. And it kind of takes into quantum physics and everything. Complexity means that even the smartest person cannot come up with a solution, which means there is no one solution. You need multiple solutions working in concert on different facets of the problem. And that's why I think warm data is, and that's what I think systemic thinking is. Systems change, sense making. They, some people are not calling it game B. Game A sucks. Game B is where we have to start working. There are too many injuries, too many distribu unequal distribution. We have a lot of political issues right now, polarization and stuff. But again, you know, quantum physics, it says, you can have a lot of different points of view. Some could be very negative, some could be positive, but how do we look at them and come into a collaborative, you know, solution? And you're going to make those solutions in the present. So complexity from the Latin means interwoven, you know, which is something that is really, it really cannot be undone. Well, I mean, sometimes I wonder how, our, our earth is, is doing with that. It consists of the interface of new evolving contexts and improvisational uh, possibilities. And this, this was way back in, in you know, the, the Romans when they were working on, on, on creating viaducts and stuff like that. That's what they would talk about. This is a complex situation. How do we deal with it? And the Greeks and the uh, Hindus and, and all your mystical uh, you know, uh, patterns of, of, our, of our species. So how do we bring this into our clinical settings and our wider global context? Awesome, isn't it? But do we start somewhere? Do we start right now? You know, do we start at this moment? So let's see. The relevance to understanding, well, next section is environment. And I said, environment is where we break our, where, where we could supersede, uh, transcend, rise above our double minds, our inner, inner psychic bubble binds. But the relevance to understanding systemic and complexity patterns is that there is an astonishing amount of available information when we widen our lens of inquiry. We know that now with the internet. This creates opportunity to resolve devastating double binds. It supports recognition of different disciplines, cultural diversity, and individual viewpoints. And by the way, if anybody wants a copy of my, uh, you know, of, of the PowerPoint afterwards, just email me. Uh, 
you know, this is an ongoing, hopefully an ongoing discussion, though, uh, and I'm looking forward to more, some dialogue. How can we access nar narratives, information, and other resources for those we join with in our helping settings? We can go crazy, you know. Uh, you know, listen, we talked about the nervous system before. We have a conscious and a subconscious also, right? We're all therapists, we know about that. The subconscious process the stimuli at 30 million per second. Everything you've ever seen or known, you know, is in that subconscious. The conscious only processes at 30 stimuli per second. That's a, 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 a million to one ratio, even more, right? You can't understand everything at once. But we do have access, and sometimes we have to slow down, go out of the box, and slash out a reality, but still simultaneously know it's connected. That's the essence. That's what made me become a, a, a family therapist. That's why I call myself a family therapist, a systemic therapist. <clears throat> so, I mean, how do we collect <laughs> I'm not going to get into this, but I, I, I feel... An indebtedness to um, to Monica McGoldrick uh, because the genogram is a wonderful format for collecting information, and so when there are family settings, I, I'm I'm astonished that a lot of family therapists do not use a genogram, and I'm not sure how exactly how they 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 collect their information. This is a standard, and uh, actually. Uh, when I showed uh, Monica McGoldrick my book, uh, she became rightfully very upset because the publisher put the wrong diagram in. So every time I sell a book now, I, I stick this the standard one in, and the, the new edition will have this in. There's many ways of collecting information. I mean, when we talk about family therapy, you know, the genogram really does stand out. And I'm not saying there aren't other ways, but the important thing is that we look at things from different perspectives. So the best way to be systemic and to understand our complex existence is just what I said before, is to have a stereoscopic lens to look at whatever situation you may find yourself in as being part of a wider, all-encompassing context. I mean, you can look at that genogram diagram and not put it in context, and it doesn't really, it just becomes demographics. But if you really look at it and, and see it in a stereoscopic way, so how do we achieve this skill of having a stereoscopic lens? I don't think it's on the, the exam that become a family therapist, but it is in between the lines. And how may it be useful? How is it useful? So possibilities, you know, the next step. And this includes the exciting realms of context, Aestheticism, creativity, coherent breathing, poetic expression, harmony, forgiveness, Tai Chi, Qi Kong, I do Aikido, I do Tai Chi. These are things when you step outside of the everyday linear cause and effect world. <clears throat> it's like, you know, pendulums that all of a sudden start swinging the same way. Or women in a dormitory will start getting their menses at the same time, or, or men who start getting their whatever at the same time, your vibrations and their communication, that they really are good communicators. So the other modalities of nature that beckon us to be mindful, to have a beginner's mind, and to mitigate unnecessary and injurious suffering. You know, I, I, I like uh, poetry. I'm from Patterson. You know, uh, there's a wonderful, beautiful falls there, and it still inspires me sometimes when I'm down and out. I just go down and walk over the falls and uh, not too long ago, I actually, I, I actually I was asked to be part of a, uh, I wish I had it up here, a, uh, uh, a program where they asked 10 artists to come together and it was based on a Japanese framework uh, where it's a pachacucha where you do, you get three minutes and you have 10 slides and you have to, and at 20 second intervals. And so I wrote this poem actually about Patterson, about the falls and with different photos of it. Inspiration is, is, is it systemic? I mean, if you're really looking at inspiration, aestheticism to me is a human metaphor for nature. It really is. I mean, I think it is. What inspires you, especially now during this crisis? You know, I, I, I wrote a poem uh, yesterday because 
you know, we're, most people I hear are from New Jersey, I, I believe. And one of the things that I would always do every year, and I've done it for the last 50 years, is go down to Newark and look at the cherry blossoms. And the cherry blossoms in Branchbrook Park uh, are the largest collection in North America, more than Washington, D.C. In fact, uh, in, back in the 60s when Japan was having a blight, the, the Japanese knew where to come. They came to Newark, believe it or not. They stopped and got some Italian bread and Italian hot dogs and a few other things. And then they went to, uh, you know, to Branchbrook Park and they took cuttings. And it really saved a lot of the uh, cherry blossoms in Japan. And here I am, I sequestered, and there was not even any virtual way of looking at it. The park was closed. <clears throat> it's an old park, you know, built in 1900. Uh, there's an old Tiffany plant on one side, and first time you ever used poured concrete. So I wrote this poem. <clears throat> Nobody's objecting, and you're all on mute. Uh, it was called Nostalgia. I was reminiscing in this surreal need to be sequestered about the magic of a certain moment. I yearned to walk amongst the shadows of April's cherry blossoms in Newark's Branchbrook Park. On its decaying bridge of ancient poured concrete to look down upon a liminality of lushness, losing myself in the past with a timeless nostalgia of having had been in its yearly rhythm. Seeking out a visit away from crowds at early sunrise to lay beneath the falling flowers. An experience of ethereal energy telling me this is an archetypical moment about nature's intent. I think poetry is, is a wonderful form of expression. Uh, I'm not saying everybody should use it, but I think we're all poets and we don't have to, you know, have it rhyme like roses are red and violets are blue. But a lot of times I'll just ask people to respond and I'll write down their responses and I'll say, here's your poem. And so sometimes I'll do things, I threw this in because I really have started doing more of this again too, uh, besides some meditating and to get to the issue to make a difference to resolve issues. And some ex suggested expressions, poetic, there's many books. Uh, John Fox is a therapist who wrote a book called uh, uh, Poetic uh, Therapy. Uh, some suggested poetic expressions that, that I use, like, you know, what do you want to courageously sing about? You know, sometimes you stop, you know, you can throw a loaf of bread or sometimes you just stop and say, you know, what do you want to sing about right now? You know, what do you want to invite in your life right now? Or I did this with an autistic child yesterday and it just blew my mind. I said, when I'm deeply listened to, I, and all of a sudden I, I, had, I couldn't get much out of him. And, and I'm trying to work with his parents and his father is kind of uh, uh, you know, not there a whole lot. And all of a sudden he started talking about if I was deeply listened to, I, compassion. You know, go right to the vagus nerve, you know. What is it to you? Write about a choice. You know, we have to take care of ourselves. You know, we, we can't take care of other people if we don't take care of ourselves. So write about a choice or a decision you will make that is important to you. I choose what? What do I choose? I can accept what is. You know, prompts are, it's just another way of sharing, another way of mutually learning. So as just to wind down, the last part is how do we make adjustments? How do we look stereoscopically? Well, first of all, to allow the sustaining power of whatever it is that we keep our system going, we have to be fallible. And fallible is knowing who you are and understanding your true self. We're not perfect. Uh, you know, someone who could be a very narcissistic person it believes they're infallible. We're all fallible. But to keep you moving forward, we have to recognize our interdependency, not just our interconnections or our partnership. Uh, I, I think we need to really look at what interdependency is. I think we need to go back into what it is that made us decide on systemic work. And if we're going to revisit it, and if, if and we're getting co-opted by insurance and, and not being able to participate in Medicare and, and all these other things when it's ridiculous, you know, I mean, it's commonsensical, it's nature. 
So can we create a collaborative consensus to reassess our sense of systemic thinking? And how do we as family therapists revitalize our systemic epistemological basis? Maybe we have to, you know, resurrect that word, which is not just for system thinking, it means the way of looking at life and actively engage in the many interdependent contexts of those we work with. I want to finish this part and we, then we have a good, a good amount of time and thanks for bearing with me. The mindfulness of Gandhi, you know, your belief becomes your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions and your actions become your habits and your habits become your values and your values become your destiny. So if you're interested in a little marketing, I'm not a good marketer, but I was told to put this in, but I, you know, I, I, I most of the, a lot of the thoughts that I, we just talked about, I, I wrote down in a, in, a, in a book that was published last, late last year. And, uh, and it just basically talks about a lot about how, how to be systemic, you know, how to be able to, to work, uh, hopefully a lot of good suggestions too.